One of the things in life that has fascinated me the most is easy to state questions which we don't know the answer to. Like, can computers learn? Can computers efficiently solve all the problems that we can realistically hope to solve? Or put differently, can computers substitute human creativity for finding mathematical proofs? But there is so much to think about and it is somewhat deep. These philosophical questions have been made very precise and transformed into well-defined mathematical problems. These are the sorts of problems that I like to think about. For me, it is especially satisfying to find answers that are elegant. I work at the intersection of mathematics and computer science, so I investigate what problems can computers solve efficiently and try to find algorithms for such problems. And also, more importantly, perhaps for me, uh, the limits of efficient computation or the limits of the ability of computers to solve various problems. So my work involves number theory, algebra and geometry on the mathematics side and uh, theoretical computer science and complexity theory especially on the computer science side. The, the fact that one can have these very easy to state philosophical questions about computers which have turned out to be extremely difficult uh, it's something that I find uh, both fascinating and, and it's sort of challenging. For example, can computers efficiently solve things in parallel? Can computers solve all the problems that we can realistically hope for them, uh, for, for them to be able to solve? Take the case of multiplying two numbers. And again, this is something, this is very basic has been done for thousands of years. But now you can ask this question, what's the fastest way to multiply two numbers? We look at the number of steps that are required by an algorithm, but we take this view in uh, computer science that instead of looking at the precise number of steps, we are more concerned with the growth as the input increases, as the size of the input increases. So. Uh, so, for example, I could start out with 200 digit numbers and look at how much time, how many steps are required to multiply them. But then I ask this question, suppose now if I were to double the size of the numbers, does the number of steps increase by a factor of 2 or a factor of 4 or a factor of 8 or, or much more than that? So, this abstraction we have found it to be really useful in computer science. This is called asymptotic analysis and the challenge here is when we want to claim that there is a fast uh, algorithm, we just give the algorithm and, and show that it works uh, well. But when you want to say that there is no algorithm which will let us say multiply two numbers in linear time, the challenge is to have some sort of a proof which can reason about all possible algorithms and, and that is an extremely large space. So, it might sound paradoxical at first that almost all problems are extremely hard and yet we do not know a single problem that is provably hard. That is sort of the, uh, the, the core of the mathematical difficulty of, of this, uh, of proving lower bounds. My work has involved programs uh, which use arithmetic operations, additions, multiplications, subtractions, divisions to do the computation. So, we had some uh, uh, progress along this line. So, we could uh, use some ideas from algebraic geometry to come up with what are called complexity measures, uh, which would which helped us prove lower bounds uh, and by, by that uh, saying that 
here are these uh, problems and the smallest number of steps required by any algorithm is at least so much. When we have uh, computers with lots of what are called cores or processors inside them on, on a motherboard, we could hope to speed up computation significantly. So, for example, if I, if I had to add, uh, let us say, 16 numbers, so, uh, and if I had many processors, so what I could do is, I could uh, divide these 16 numbers into uh, 8 pairs and give one processor the task of adding the two numbers in each pair. Then take these eight pairs, uh, the sums of these eight pairs, again divide them into four pairs and repeat. But then you can now ask, is, is it po possible to parallelize every algorithm? And we believe that the answer is no. There are things where the best algorithm is inherently sequential. You cannot replace it with another algorithm which divides up work into processors and then combines them and gets the answer quicker. But we do not know how to prove that. For some algorithms which are extremely parallel in nature, they, uh, we could show lower bounds which means that uh, we could G uh, give a task or a problem uh, and show that any very highly parallel algorithm for that problem uh, will require a long amount of time. Okay, So, uh, I should mention here that it turns out also that given enough number of processors or given enough what we call given a large enough circuit size everything can be uh, parallelized and that also is a uh, somewhat interesting statement. So, now the real question is what is the trade off as you uh, make things more and more parallel, how does the total amount of work that needs to be done or the total size of the circuit that is required, how does uh, that trade off go. Uh, so, so, one of the results uh, that we had some years ago and which is cited in the Infosys price is that um, for some very highly uh, parallel uh, forms of computation, there are these problems where the amount of work involved or the total size of the or the uh, the total number of steps involved are very large. These uh, problems are functions that we uh, were studying in uh, lower bounds. Uh, they are called polynomials uh, in, in the maths literature. Polynomials also correspond to geometric shapes. Uh, and what we are looking for are these lower bound uh, questions saying that uh, these, th there are these polynomials for which the number of steps required to compute the polynomial is very large. Now, uh, so in, in some sense we are trying to understand the inherent structure of polynomials. Uh, on, on a completely different note in unsupervised learning, we have data. So, uh, for example, our data could be just the corpus of all books in the world. So, textual data or the set of all images or audio files and things like that. And in unsupervised learning, we want to understand what is the uh, underlying structure of this data. So, uh, so for la example, language has grammar. and so. So, there is some structure in language. If I just give a computer all this data, no labeling, uh, just and ask it to learn about language or about uh, real world images, whatever it can, uh, what can the computer do. So, it, uh, it turns out that uh, 
in certain situations like this where you have lots of data, you can take the statistics of that data. Uh, like for example, you could compute certain averages. Uh, so uh, like if, when you have a whole bunch of images, you could look at the average value of the first pixel in the image, the average value of the second pixel in the image and other statistics like the correlations between two pixels in the image and so on. And, and here's the connection to polynomials. You take these statistics of my of the data and put them as the coefficients of a polynomial. Or think of this collection of statistics as a polynomial. And it turns out that the structure of that data gets reflected in the uh, in the structure of this polynomial and more specifically in the smallest number of steps required to compute a polynomial. Uh, and we found one more connection uh, uh, here. It turns out that the proofs that are or, or the techniques which are used to prove lower bounds, the proofs contain certain mathematical objects which are also useful for learning. So, uh, so now uh, you can ask this question, can a computer itself learn to find the best algorithm? These algorithms are essentially finding the structure inside these polynomials and because of this connection of uh, polynomials to real world data sets where you think of the statistics of the data set as a polynomial, it can be used to understand the structure of data sets as well. So, so nowadays we do a lot of uh, financial transactions using our phones. Uh, my phone is communicating with my bank for this and anyone with a suitable device can overhear all the communication between my phone and the mobile tower or my phone and the bank. So then the question becomes, can such a person uh, impersonate me uh, and then do fraudulent transactions on my behalf? How do we communicate uh, with each other so that someone who overhears everything that we say still doesn't understand what we are talking at all? Uh, and and when I first came across this, I thought this was an impossible thing. But it turns out that remarkably there is an algorithm to do this. And the key insight in developing that algorithm uh, is this conjecture, is this mathematical conjecture that uh, if I give you a number, finding two smaller numbers whose product is the given number, this, this problem is called factoring. This is a hard problem. So, we, uh, just to elaborate on this, we all know how to multiply. Given two numbers, how to uh, multiply them and find the product. This in factoring is the inverse problem. Given a number, find the factors. Uh, and we believe that this is a hard problem. Uh, like the number of steps required will grow very, very quickly as the size of the numbers increases. And yet we don't know how to prove it. But if we, uh, if we assume that this is true, then uh, there is this algorithm or protocol which will make use of this assumption to help us communicate securely. Now, if someone were to tomorrow find a, a fast way to factor numbers that might break all our communication, um, all our mobile communication and uh, like basically all our digital commerce will become very insecure. One part which is often seen up to undergraduate and maybe up to master's level is assimilating the existing knowledge uh, and 
building good intuition uh, for the subject and uh, uh, my uh, suggestion would be that uh, like to allow oneself time to assimilate and uh, what I found very useful is talking to people and uh, talking to people uh, in their respective areas if they can give you time. Uh, they can often give intuition uh, uh, about the things that they are working on which is uh, difficult to obtain uh, just from the technical reports and the papers. Then later as one goes into research and trying to discover new things, uh, here uh, of course uh, there are various aspects to it like what are the important problems in the area. That of course uh, one gets a sense of that again by talking to people, talking to active researchers in the field. Uh, and then there is this aspect of uh, trying and failing in, in, uh, and like getting comfortable with trying out an idea and then finding out that it does not work uh, or it is very difficult to make that idea uh, work for the problem that you are looking at. And also getting comfortable with this uh, that um, you know, the tools that we have uh, today for trying to answer these questions might not be good enough. Uh, so, so, there is a lot of uncertainty involved in research. Uh, to have this mindset that uh, things are uncertain and, and, and one has to just keep trying and failing and hopefully learn from the failure and just keep trying again and again. Yeah, when I uh, won the Infosys Prize, the first uh, reaction was joy at the at having my work being recognized uh, and then soon after it was followed by a significant amount of anxiety uh, firstly because um, like science is always a collaborative effort my, I, and my work has also been in collaboration with others and in particular Chandan Saha at the Inst Institute of Science here. Uh, and so, uh, so, so whether it is ok that I should only receive the prize and uh, like recognizing their work. Also it, uh, the fact that some uh, of the prize winners have gone on to do tremendous work in their fields and uh, whether I will be able to live up to th that uh, or not. Um, so, I hope to continue uh, making progress on and com continue to do impactful work uh, on the questions that I, uh, on some of these basic questions in computer science.